welcome New Hope at Home and Friends of New Hope to the Wednesday night Bible study. I always have to look at my notes to find out what the date is because I never remember. It is Wednesday, September 20th, 2023, and we're here at New Hope Presbyterian Church in Fort Myers, Florida on Plantation Road. So if you want to come in person, join us. We are actually in the lobby of the uh, church auditorium on Wednesday nights now, and we'd love to have you from 6.30 to about 7.45. And um, otherwise, I'm glad that you've tuned in. The, the scriptures are on the board behind you. We go to them in that order. If you've been watching before, you know how this works. And if you, if you haven't, we like to put sticky notes in, or you can at home pause your camera and plug them in, because this is not live stream. Um, anyway, welcome everybody. I'm so glad you're here. Uh, we've been talking about, gosh, the whole broader picture of covenant and how within covenant we are made this prophet, priest, and king. I'll, I'll dig into that a little bit more in a minute. But I want to focus on specifically where we've been the last, well, last week, and then kind of this week, and it's, it's been tying in for a long time. Last week, the title of the message was Covenant. We good? Yeah, you just go Oh, okay. Covenant and the force of the enemy. I want you to notice some of the language it was from last week, and it's going to carry over into this week. The force of the enemy. Matthew 11, verse 12, and I'll be probably quoting that later, where Jesus is saying, since the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God has been forcefully advancing and forceful men lay hold of it. Or one of the translations says, violent men lay hold of it. Of course, the picture there is of John the Baptist. They're gonna lay hold of his life, take his life, so those forceful negative satanic forces, and yet at the same time, we as believers meet that force too. This is, this is not a sit back and take it easy sort of life. And although we rest in the promises of God, they are laid hold of, and there is a certain force and violence to that. And if we know that, because that's how the enemy works, and if we know that, we begin to know how we fight, how we do spiritual battle. So this is kind of following up on last week tonight. So if, if last week was covenant and the force of the enemy, tonight I'm calling the message covenant and the passionate pursuit of holiness. So notice the word, the force of the enemy or the passionate pursuit of holiness. You get this picture of aggression or pressing in with force because that's what we have to do. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. So last week, we were in 2 Kings 18 and 19. We're going, to, we're going to kind of touch on that again tonight. But we're also going to go into 2 Chronicles 29 for about four chapters. And how many of you know that what we're reading in 2 Kings 18 is going to be told again in 2 Chronicles 29? I realize you don't probably know that specific thing. But... The, the books of the kings, first and second kings, gives us the narrative of that whole history of the monarchy in Israel. And Chronicles kind of recaps that. It sort of gives supplemental information. And the emphasis on Chronicle, in Chronicles is on the remnant that's left. Why is that important? Because it's all about the holiness of the line that Jesus is going to come from. So it's protecting the, the priestly system. It's it's bringing to our attention all the purity, all the good things that God is doing in the nation of Israel. So what we're getting, and I love this in this particular narrative about King Hezekiah, is that we get to see in kings the, the human force of what was going on with these people in the face of the enemy attack. And I love that section last week in 2 Kings. I had asked you when you're listening don't just read it. I want you to feel what these people were going through. Feel what the enemy, the king, king Sennacherib of, of Assyria, because what was it? Is it just a man? Well, no, it's not just a man. What's happening when we read about enemies? Who's that, who is really at work in that case? Yes, yeah, Satan himself and his demons, and he works through people. I'm not saying everybody's demon-possessed, but understand what I'm saying it's that understanding of those two kingdoms that are at work. So in 2 Kings, the emphasis was on the enemy and his voice and what it sounded like and the response of the people. And you could just feel the weight of it crushing them. And yet King Hezekiah stands 
but he was staggering under the load. When we read it in Chronicles, it's going to come out different. But I love that, how scripture just blossoms and gives us this fuller picture of what's going on. Jump back to, to 2 Kings, just to kind of remind you what we looked at last week. And this was what that, that battle was where the commander of the Assyrian army, so he's one of the minions of Sennacherib, what he is saying to the people and how powerful his voice is. This is why I wanted you to feel it. Because when I could read that and having understood what it feels like to be attacked, when you feel it, you're, you're just like, oh my gosh. You, it almost feels like somebody's punching you in the chest. And that's the sense that we get from this. But the voice, the, the big emphasis last week was the voice. So in verse 28 of chapter 18 of 2 Kings, it says, so the commander stood and called out in Hebrew, that was the language that they would all understand, hear the word. I want you to hear me, the great king of Assyria. And then what does he say? Do not let Hezekiah deceive you. Do not let Hezekiah persuade you to trust in the Lord when he says the Lord will surely deliver us. Do not listen to Hezekiah. This is what I say. Make peace with me. Come out to me. And he goes on and describes this good land he wants to give them. Sounds exactly like the book of Deuteronomy, doesn't it? where Moses is telling the people God is bringing you into this good land, and then he ends it up with choose life, not death. Deuteronomy 30, I've set before you life and death, choose life. So the voice of the enemy is really overwhelming to these people, and in some ways it sounds like the voice of God, and that's when it gets the trickiest part because the devil is so slick and so overwhelmingly powerful, not to God, but certainly to us. So that's the picture of what was going on in 2 Kings. And what I wanted you to understand or get a sense of is that pulsating, continual pressure of the two kingdoms and these competing voices. Competing voices in our minds and in our hearts. Remember we talked last week about there being two kingdoms. I know some of you weren't here. Uh, if you want to go back and listen to the video, you can always do that but the understanding that there are two kingdoms. Now, remember in 1 Kings after Solomon's sin, and then the kingdom split, and Rehoboam says, no, i got to reunite these tribes, and God says, no, don't do that. Don't go to war against your brothers. This is what? My doing. I'm doing this thing. And we think, what? God wants the kingdom split? Do you understand there's always been two kingdoms? There's always been two kingdoms. Since Satan was kicked out of heaven, Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. What does he mean? I saw him come down. Before when? That had been before creation. Before creation, there were two kingdoms. And so what is, what is God doing? Rescuing us from the kingdom of darkness and conveying us into the kingdom of the son of his love where we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. That's the whole message. So in these two kingdoms, there is pressure. There is pressure. What does the enemy really want from us? When you get down to the root of it, yeah, but he can't have them, right? When we're already his, we're already God's. The root of really what we all struggle with. The enemy wants us to doubt God. He wants to put lies in our minds about who God is. So let me just kind of digress a minute and talk about because this was kind of coming up in me as I was preparing this message. The root of all sin is really unbelief. Now, we can look at accounts in 2 Kings and say, what were those people having to fight against? What was the devil doing? Well, he's terrifying them. So we could say, well, it's fear or it's shame. All their brothers had fallen. They thought they couldn't stand. But in the Garden of Eden, when Eve was tempted, she was not afraid of the devil. He was actually a beautiful being to her. She didn't have any shame any self-condemnation, which is a big tool of the enemy now. Yet, <laughs> she didn't have it yet, but as soon as that first sin of Adam and Eve, what happened? Fear, hiding, shame. And so we fight all that sense. So yes, that's a, a great tactic of the enemy, but when you really go down to the root of it, where, what happened to Eve? Where was her sin? We are God's highest created beings. And he gave Adam and Eve what? Rule over the garden. He created us to be independent, not of him, but independent and rulers, to have dominion. 
So what happens with rulers? They think. They take charge. So in this state that God gave us to be in, Eve, in her heart, we know the lies of the devil, but in her heart, Eve questioned, really, the goodness of the command of God. Is it good? Is it really right for me? Is he really right? She's calling God's character into question. So see, that's why we can say the root of all sin is really unbelief. I really don't believe God is everything he says. I really don't believe he's going to do everything he says. Now, we wouldn't say that here, but our hearts say that when we long for something different than what God says is good and right for us. So, and this is the battle. It, the battle is for our hearts. We've talked so much about our hearts. But this is why unbelief becomes belief when we don't believe. And then finally we begin to believe. It's because it comes in these ever-deepening layers with every battle. We emerge from that stronger in belief until more and more we really, truly desire, really, in the real sense, I really, truly desire to pursue holiness. We're in myself, without that transforming work of the Holy Spirit, let's face it, we do not have a desire for holiness. In 2 Chronicles 29, we see Hezekiah pursuing holiness. In 2 Kings 18, we see the human part of that battle. We see the force of the enemy. What's so powerful is when you feel the force of the enemy, what kind of feelings come with that? Because I always want this to be reachable for us to understand. What kind of feelings? We're, we're intimidated. We're, we're swept along. We're afraid. He engulfs us. He exacts from us. There is a pressure. And yet, when we get to Chronicles, the devil is not front and center, but Hezekiah's pursuit of holiness is what's front and center. So where we have actually three chapters in 2 Kings about Hezekiah's life and reign, and we haven't even looked at the final chapter. We may not even do that in his later life. So he actually had some pride and, and sinned, repents, and he's okay again. But in 2 Chronicles, we have four chapters, and three full chapters are only about Hezekiah's pursuit of holiness and the response of the people. And the tone... And, and what rises up in you when you read that, hearing the voice of God compared to what you feel and what you experience when you're experiencing hearing the voice of the enemy, this is where we get tripped up. Because it sounds, he's saying things that sound real and feel real, and when we can blame ourselves and say, well, I just got to try harder, I'm not making it, what is that? It sounds really right, doesn't it? And what, but what do you feel? There's this pressure. There's not this freedom that comes from listening to the voice of God when he says, if you just trust me, if you just hold on and you press through that and you see what grace really is and you see what his salvation really looks like, everything's different. The whole tone is different. What you feel inside is this freedom and this lightness. So I'm getting ahead of myself, which is what I tend to do. So let's go to uh, 2 Chronicles. Holiness is front and center in this account in Chronicles. We see that scripture just blossom with the fullness in that picture of God, that eternal God. Now in, um, let's look at chapter 29. Actually, no, let, I'm sorry, let's go back to 1 Kings 18. Let me just, I want to set the stage again for, for this, where Hezekiah is at. 2 Kings 18. Yeah, let's go back to 2 Kings 18. Because these first eight verses kind of, uh, sum up what it takes about three chapters to say in Second Chronicles, because we get all the great detail. And I, I'm not reading you three chapters tonight, so don't freak out. My voice would never hold up that long. I want you to hear the language. I want you to hear the strength of the language, the passion, the aggression, the violence. Now, every time I use that word, I don't want you to think if we're talking clubs and knives and blood. And, but you understand what I mean when I say there's a violent taking hold of and I want, it's important, you need to see the force of these words, and I pointed this out last week. In the third year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. And he was 25 years old when he became king. He reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. Now listen, he removed the high places, smashed the sacred stones, cut down the Asherah poles, 
He broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses had made, for up to that time the Israelites had been burning incense to it. They had made it an unclean thing. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before him or after him. He held fast to the Lord and did not cease to follow him. Do you see that steadfast, deliberate, did not cease? He kept the commands the Lord had given Moses, and the Lord was with him. He was successful in whatever he undertook. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. Now, last week I said this was this sabotage. He rebelled against the king of Assyria. You see the force of that? Who's he talking about? I took a stand against the enemy and did not serve him. That was a forceful thing. From watchtower to fortified city, he defeated the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory. Of course, we know then that what that ushered in is this major attack by the king of Assyria. So without being able to review last week, uh, it's, a, it's a marvelous story. Go back and read it, or go back and, and watch the video. So when we pick up in chapter 29 of Second Chronicles, I'm just going to read some verses. I, your scripture list, I could not, I'm just going through here and I underline some stuff. So you follow me. And, and it's not necessarily repeated exactly what verses I'm in on your scripture sheet, but you should get it. Here we go. Hezekiah, verse 1, was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father of David had done. We just read this in Kings. Verse 3. In the first month of the first year of his reign. Look at this. First month of the first year, immediately, he opened the doors of the temple of the Lord and repaired them. Why would he open the doors of the temple of the Lord and repair them? Well, to understand what's going on, you have to go back to the previous chapter. And we can do that real quick. Just look at chapter 28, verse 24. This is Ahaz, his father, an evil king, and look what he does. Ahaz gathered together the furnishings from the temple of God and took them away, or my footnote says, cut them up from the temple. He shut the doors of the Lord's temple and set up altars at every street corner in Jerusalem. In every town in Judah, he built high places to burn sacrifices to what? Other gods and provoked the Lord, the God of his fathers, to anger. Remember when you're reading in these Old Testament accounts and people will think, oh, God is being just so vicious. Do you understand the context of what he's doing? How far these people have fallen? We're near the end of the independence of Judah. Samaria has already fallen. The kingdom, northern kingdom has already fallen. Judah is probably 100 years from it. And we're going to see some reform. But look how bad it's gotten. Why does God have to take the measures he does? Because he's got to save the race. They're, they will implode on themselves if he doesn't. So this is what Hezekiah has to do. Now let's go back to uh, chapter 29, verse 4. He brought in, so he's opening the doors. What's he doing? He's repairing the temple. He brought in the priests and the Levites, assembled them in the square on the east side, and said, listen to me, Levites, consecrate yourselves now and consecrate the temple of the Lord. That means purify yourself. The God of your fathers, remove all defilement from the sanctuary. Our fathers were unfaithful. They did evil in the eyes of the Lord our God and forsook him. They turned their faces away from the Lord's dwelling place and turned their backs on him. Just You see the attitude change. They turned from him. They also shut the doors of the portico and put out the lamps. They did not burn incense or present any burnt offerings at the sacrifice at the sanctuary to the God of Israel. Remember, that was done twice a day. And the incense. And the lights never went out. Look what, they just shut the whole system down. Therefore, verse 8, the anger of the Lord has fallen on Judah and Jerusalem. He has made them an object of dread and horror and scorn, as you can see with your own eyes. This is why our fathers have fallen by the sword, and why our sons and daughters and our wives are in captivity. Think he's right? Verse 10, now I intend to make a covenant with the Lord the God of Israel, so that his fierce anger will turn away from us. What's he really meaning he's doing? He's going to return to that covenant. He's going to bring the people back to the covenant that God made with them in Exodus 19. We always are back at Exodus 19. Verse 11, my sons, do not be negligent now, 
For the Lord has chosen you. He's talking to the Levites. He's talking to the, to the priests. He has chosen you to stand before him and serve him, to minister before him and to burn incense. Jump to verse 15. So when they had assembled their brothers and consecrated themselves, just hang on to that thought. The priests, the Levites, have to do what? Consecrate themselves before they go in to purify the temple. What does that mean? What do we have to always deal with first? Our own sin before we can deal with anybody else's. That's a primary thing with the priests, which we're going to be doing a lot of talking about. So they do that. They, they do all that they need to do at the temple. Early the next morning, King Hezekiah, verse 20, sorry. King Hezekiah, I want you to notice the actions of this king, the, the deliberateness, the intentionality, the, the unswayed way which he just goes about what he needs to do. Early the next morning, King Hezekiah gathered the city officials together and went up to the temple of the Lord, and they brought seven bulls, seven rams, seven male lambs, and seven male goats as a sin offering for what? The king. For the kingdom, for the sanctuary, and for Judah. The king commanded the priests. Now, if you've been listening to us talk about prophet, priest, and king, you're going to be making that connection. So hold on to that thought. He commanded the priests to offer these on the altar of the Lord. So, of course, they do. Verse 25, he, Hezekiah, stationed the Levites in the temple of the Lord with cymbals, harps, lyres, in the way prescribed by David and Gad, the king's seer, and Nathan the prophet. This was commanded by the Lord through his prophets. What's he doing? He's consulting the word of God. He's going back to what the word says. In implementing this, verse 27, Hezekiah gave the order to sacrifice the burnt offering on the altar. Verse 29, when the offerings were finished, the king and everyone present with him knelt down and worshipped. And King Hezekiah and his officials ordered the Levites to praise the Lord with the words of David and Asaph the seer. Do you see the, the stand he's taking? He's a king, but what is he really acting like? He's acting like a priest. Keep that in mind. Uh, verse 35, the second half of verse 35. So the service of the temple of the Lord was reestablished. The Levites are in there. The sacrifices are beginning to go on. Hezekiah and all the people rejoiced at what God had brought about for his people because it was done so quickly. Chapter 30. Now he's going to celebrate the Passover. See, we didn't hear all this in Kings. We just heard about him smashing the stuff. We didn't hear the whole elaborate everything he's gone through. Hezekiah sent word to all Israel and Judah and also wrote letters to Ephraim and Manasseh, inviting them to come to the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem and celebrate the Passover to the Lord, the God of Israel. Now remember, Ephraim was the capital, uh, excuse me, Samaria was the capital of um, Israel, the northern kingdom. But Samaria, or <laughs> Ephraim was one of the main tribes. So Ephraim is one of those ten tribes. And what are they doing? Ephraim and Manasseh, there's two. They're inviting them. What are they doing? They're going back to these conquered people. Where were they? Well, they were all kind of swept away, but what the Assyrians did, that I think they all did anyway, so I don't know why they just really associate this mostly with the Assyrians, but they mixed the people up. So what did that do? It broke the national morale. So they were kind of like just really watered down. They, they serve God, but they also serve this one. Now, not a ton of time has gone on here. But you have to remember that the northern kingdom never had a good king. They didn't have revival and reform. Judah did again and again. So they're kind of a mess. But this is why the Jews of the New Testament hate the Samaritans. You understand that? So if you go back in the history, it gives you a little more understanding of when the Samaritans wanted to come back. They wanted to come back and, and help rebuild the temple. And the people of Judah were like, no way. You're not part of this. You don't even worship God for real. When you paid a price like Judah paid because of idolatry, you're not going to let anybody else get next to you that's doing that stuff. So they started out with the right ideas of purity. But what happened over time, now you hear in the New Testament about the Good Samaritan and Jesus going through Samaria, because by that time it was just, we just can't stand these people. And it was self-righteousness. So what does Jesus do? He goes to correct all these religious ideas that people have. And he calls up, just try, it's me. What did he say to the woman at the well? in Samaria? it's just me that you need. Focus on me. I'm what all this is about. So what was a good thing became a bad thing. 
they became the Pharisees. These people are unclean. Do you see what happens? Do you see how easily we veer off once we get in the flesh and we don't stay true to the heart of God and what he was trying to do? We miss the whole message. They miss the whole, the whole love message, the whole universal language of what Jesus came to do. Of course, the Pharisees missed it anyway. Um, so where were we? Oh, so they write these letters. Jump to verse 6. At the king's command, couriers went throughout Israel and Judah, begging these people, return to the Lord, come. Verse 10. The couriers went from town to town, and Ephraim and Manasseh and as far as Zebulun. But the people scorned and ridiculed them. Nevertheless, some men of Asher, Manasseh, and Zebulun humbled themselves and went to Jerusalem. Also in Judah, the hand of God was on the people to give them what? Unit. Yes, one heart. Unity of mind to carry out what the king and his officials had ordered. So some of the northern people are coming back. Remember this, when we talk about, just historically, well, the northern kingdom just ceased to exist, because it did as a kingdom. Politically, they, they never resettled anywhere, but there were individuals from those 10 tribes that did make their way back. They were not all completely lost. It's just that the remnant was Judah. So now the people are really getting fired up. Verse 13, a very large crowd of people assembled in Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread in the second month. They removed the altars in Jerusalem and cleared away the incense altars and threw them into the Kidron Valley. The people are becoming enthusiastic in their worship. Jump down to verse 17. And this is so cool. This is just so the heart of God. Since many in the crowd had not consecrated themselves, the Levites had to kill the Passover lambs for all those who were not ceremonially clean and could not consecrate their lambs to the Lord. This was all happening so fast. They were so far off the system. There was no priests and Levites doing anything until Hezekiah reestablished it, and now he's got Passover. So they're scurrying to get it all right. Verse 18, although most of the many people who came from Ephraim, Manasseh, Issachar, and Zebulun, that's four of the northern tribes, they had not purified themselves, yet they ate the Passover, contrary to what was written. Uh-oh. <laughs> but Hezekiah prayed for them, saying what? May the Lord, who is good, pardon everyone who what? Sets his heart on seeking God, the Lord, the God of his fathers, even if he is not clean according to the rules of the sanctuary. Do you see this? The, the law written on the heart, not the law written on the stone. It's always been God's heart, long before the New Testament. And what verse 20 say? And the Lord what? Heard Hezekiah. And healed the people. God saying, this is all I've been asking for. That's all I've ever asked you for was your hearts. Uh, the, verse 21. The Israelites who were present in Jerusalem celebrated the Feast of Unleavened Bread for seven days with great rejoicing. While the Levites and priests sang to the Lord every day, accompanied by the Lord's instruments of praise. Hezekiah spoke encouragingly to all the Levites who showed good understanding of the service of the Lord. Verse 23, the whole assembly then agreed to celebrate the festival seven more days. Verse 24, Hezekiah, king of Judah, provided a thousand bulls. We'll see again later. He provides out of his own resources for the sacrifices. Jump to verse 26. There was great joy in Jerusalem, for since the days of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, there had been nothing like this in Jerusalem. The priests and the Levites stood to bless the people, and God heard them, for their prayer reached heaven, his holy dwelling place. Their prayer was acceptable. There was repentance. There was sacrifice. We're going we're gonna to keep going, but I want to point out, do you hear this pattern? Now, where it says there was great joy in Jerusalem for since the days of Solomon until now. Do you remember Solomon until now? It's over 200 years. What happened under Solomon? The kingdom split because of idolatry. Remember when we talked about these, this pattern in scripture. I should keep giving credit to the author of that book, and I can't remember now who it is. But this is not my drawing. God had a perfect plan. We saw that in Genesis 3. Genesis 1 and 2, and God's perfect plan was... Messed up in Genesis 3, right? Because of what? Sin. Sin. So we were broken. 
I've said this, is re this pattern is maintained in Scripture. Exodus 19, God had another perfect plan. I'm making this covenant. Just stick with me. Trust me. Listen to me. It's going to be good. It's going to be great for you guys. Did they keep it? No. Solomon, God had a perfect plan, gave him all this wisdom, did all these things. Solomon couldn't have asked for any more. And yet, chapter 11, nevertheless, Solomon, king of Israel, loved many foreign women. His heart turned. He's broken their sin. There's always a way back. It's repentance. It's the sacrifice. Obviously, it's Jesus in the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, it's all pictured through those sacrifices. So the way back out of our misery is through the cross. And then God begins this restoration. Restoring. I love that. We're going to be talking about this pretty soon, just so I can't seem to get away from it. That whole picture that we are restored, that he heard the people, he heard their cries. He wasn't waiting for them to do penance. He knows their hearts have turned, so they are restored, but there is still a restoring going on, because we always are in this life. So it's what God declares, because he chooses to, and then it's what he develops in us. But what I want you to understand is how that goes on. So you see that pattern. Now, I don't know if you remember, but a little while ago, we talked about King Josiah. He's a, the last good king of Judah. His reign ends like maybe 20 years before the city is taken. So we'll have some years, but, but this, I don't know, he's 50 or 60 or so, so years before Josiah. That's not very long. They'll fall again. That's why Josiah has to do all the reforms. They don't even know what the Bible is. They find it in the temple and go, I got this book. I mean, how sad. But this is what we fall to. This is what we fall to. Happens again and again and again. Now, I want you to go to chapter 31. The people continue to, to smash the Asherah poles and get rid of all the idolatry. Uh, verse 3, the king contributed from his own possessions for the morning and evening burnt offerings. Verse 4, he ordered the people living in Jerusalem to give the portion due to the priests. Verse 5, as soon as the order went out, the Israelites generously gave. And so all these offerings come in. And verse 6, the last phrase in verse 6 says, there was so much they piled them in heaps. The generosity of these people. Jump down to verse 20. Just the very tail end of chapter 31. <coughs> This is what Hezekiah did throughout Judah, doing what was good and right and faithful before the Lord his God. In everything that he undertook in the service of God's temple, in an obedience to the law and the commands, he sought his God and worked what? Wholeheartedly. Obedience from the heart. And so he <coughs> prospered. He prospered. What is God's plan? What is he doing here? I want us to look at our same little drawing. I'm not going to do it as elaborately, and at some point we will again, just as a refresher on some of this. God made this covenant with the people of Israel, and I say with us, because I've shown you again and again, it just follows through scripture. It's not just Exodus 19. Yes, there was peculiar things in that time that not every little tidbit of that applies. But what God was doing, he's been doing all along. He wanted to be in relationship with us. And he did it through this covenant. Exodus 19. Remember what I did to the Egyptians when I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Remember in 2 Kings, the, the, the enemy, come to me. Do you hear that? That forcefulness. His is an invitation. Come. I brought you to me. Now if you will hear my voice and keep my commands, you will for be for me a kingdom of priests and a what? Holy nation. In this covenant, God is developing his people, and we've been talking, and again, I'm not going to get real elaborate, but I want to talk a little bit again about that prophet, priest, and king, and how that's done in covenant. So let's talk a little bit about what those roles are. They're, they overlap. Did you notice that Hezekiah 
was a king, but he was acting like a what? Priest. priest. He was actually actively leading the priests. Why was he prosperous? Because he obeyed. Because he obeyed God. He's obeying the laws of God. He is passionately pursuing what? Holiness. Holiness. And so he prospered. It was the priest that made the king. It was his priestly endeavors, even though he's not technically in the priestly line, that made him a successful king. These roles overlap. The priest is the heart of God. Now, just so you remember, the prophet... It all points to Jesus. These are all how God governed his people in the Old Testament. Like I said, I'm not going to get real involved in this tonight. But the prophet is simply the one that, that represents God to the people, full of the word of God, how he speaks. The word of God isn't just what's on the written page. I mean, it's all inclusive there, but it's that we understand it's what he commands me. It's his word. It's not just what does the Bible say. This is the word of God. What is he telling us? And so Jesus, of course, was the word that became flesh. He was the ultimate prophet in flesh. He was the priest because he not only was the high priest, it only had to offer the sacrifice once, didn't have to worry about his sin first because there wasn't any in him. And then he became the perfect sacrifice. So it blew the whole, there was no more need. There was no more need. That song, that old Easter song, remember that? So the lamb ran away in Easter. Why? They didn't need the lamb. Jesus hung on the cross. The lamb ran away. That's the most poignant song to me. And then, of course, the king. Jesus is the king of kings. And why does he have a name that's exalted above every other name? It says in is it Philippians 2, he emptied himself. And therefore, God gave him the name that's above every other name. So when we're looking at prophet, priest, and king, this is what really sums them all up. That's the heart of God, because you could describe Jesus. That's the fullest picture of Jesus as the heart of God. It's the fullest picture we get of him in scripture because the priest sums it all up. He was a king because he emptied himself. We are prophets in the sense that we have the word of God in us. If the Holy Spirit lives in you, in a sense, the word has become flesh, <clears throat> dwelt among with each other because his word is in us. I'm not saying we're all prophets, so please don't go tell people that. that we're all, best as every one of us is a prophet. Well. That will, be, that will sound misleading. But that spirit of prophecy is in all of us. If the spirit of God is in us, it can't be in either way. We're kings just because we're made in his image. Non-believers have a kingly role. Crowned with glory and honor, it says in Psalm 8. So we carry some of that innately, always growing, of course, in it. But that priest role, one word that would summarize the priest and I realize there's a lot of layers of that, is holiness. They're the standard for holiness. They're the ones that protected the holiness. All of that elaborate stuff you see in Scripture is just about the holiness of God. So the priest is all about the holiness and all that entails, and we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that. But this is why God said to his people, you will be for me a kingdom of priests, in fact, in Revelation, the older translations would say, you will be for me kings and priests ruling forever. So you see the royalty. We're not going to get off in 1 Peter 2 to using all those same terms. But the priest is the holiness that involves everything about what Jesus was. So this is what we're going to spend some time looking at. It. But I want you to understand that that is not innate. None of us would seek holiness, even when we think we would. I'm telling you, when you go through the layers and God starts dealing with you on your motives and what you're really thinking, when you're really being honest, you realize you cannot help your heart. You think you can. But when the brass tacks come, your heart will want to lead you where you don't really want it to lead you, but you can't seem to help yourself. You know the destruction's coming, but you can't seem to help yourself. And we see this in the lives of people that we know that have lived destructive lives. And I'm saying it's in all of us, every one of us. So holiness is a pursuit. Hezekiah was pursuing holiness, and he was doing it vigorously. Now let's go to chapter 32, verse 1. We've just read about all these things Hezekiah does. 
worked wholeheartedly, and so he prospered. The very next verse. After all that Hezekiah had so faithfully done, what happened? Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and invaded Judah and laid siege to the fortified cities, thinking to conquer them for himself. The aggression starts. Now, we learned in First or Second Kings that Hezekiah rebelled. And when he rebelled, what happened? The king came out in mass force against him. The passionate pursuit of holiness arouses the rage of the enemy. It just does. Remember those two kingdoms. Remember how Hezekiah and the people understood when they rent their clothes, that's a sign of having been in the presence of blasphemy. That's what the Pharisees kept doing to Jesus when he'd say something like, I'm God. And they would say, oh, blasphemy, and they would tear their clothes. Blasphemy means speaking evil against God. And the power of the defense Last week in 2 Kings 18 that Hezekiah mounted was that he saw through to the heart of the conflict. It wasn't just, oh, the devil's out to get me. He saw what was going on. God, he has insulted you. So when he knows that he's insulted God, you see what I'm saying? That's, he understands there's two kingdoms going on here. The devil wants to defeat the kingdom of God, and he will do it. He will wound you in the process. So Hezekiah, even though the enemy has been outraged, look at what he does. He, he makes preparations, and we're going to see a different tone here than we saw in 2 Kings. So again, I urge you to go back and, and read that, because it's just, it's just such a powerful account of, of, of people just terrorized by an enemy. Verse 6, chapter 32. He appointed military officers over the people and assembled them before him in the square at the city gate and encouraged them with these words, Be strong and courageous, do not be afraid or discouraged because of the king of Assyria and the vast army with him, for there is a greater power with us than with him. With him is only the arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people, what? Gain, rested, good word. Gained confidence, relied on what Hezekiah, the king of Judah, said. Do you see the strength of a leader that is passionately pursuing holiness, which is just simply the ways of God, the work of God, all of that. So he prepares and he stands, even though in 2 Kings we see the weight of that stand and the choices he had to make until God broke, the, God broke it down. And we read that in Isaiah 10, how that happened. Verse 20. Look here now at the power of this king acting as a priest, full of the word of God. <laughs> this king, full of the word of God, there he is fulfilling the prophecy. There he is, the king, standing as the king, in power. Why? Because he's done all the priestly things. Verse 20, King Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, cried out in prayer to heaven about this. And the Lord sent an angel who annihilated all the fighting men and the leaders and officers in the camp of the Assyrian king. So he withdrew to his own land in disgrace. And when he went into the temple of his God, some of his sons cut him down with the sword. We saw all this last week. So the Lord saved Hezekiah and the people of Jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib, king of Assyria, and from the hand of all the others. He took care of them on every side. Don't you love that? Mm -hmm. He gave them rest. He took care of them. Do you see the tenderness of God? You don't get that from the devil. He might promise you pleasure. He might sound so alluring that you almost can't help yourself. But he cannot take care of you and give you rest. Verse 23, many brought offerings to Jerusalem for the Lord and valuable gifts for Hezekiah, king of Judah. From then on, he was highly regarded by all nations. You know what I love about this account in 2 Chronicles? where in Kings, the enemy was expanded. All we heard was him, and I said, we needed to do that. We needed to hear him. We needed to look him in the face and know who he was and what he said and feel a little scared because he's bigger than you and I. But I love how in Chronicles, the enemy is condensed. We see him. He's active. He's powerful. But the theme here is holiness and righteousness growing, being pursued, and the fruit of it which is joy, unity, 
blessing plenty prosperity the people are it's like a yeast that just comes out like this it just keeps spreading like this uncontainable work of the spirit now that yeast that spreads we saw that in second kings 18 in the voice of the enemy that wants to do the same thing just kind of take over but the feeling is so different you get the tone here in chronicles what's happening these people are they're just it, the springs of living water are just oozing out of them why because they're serving god and there's joy and there's peace and there's happiness and my goodness this is what we were created for but the voice of the enemy pulls and strangles and threatens and intimidates and lures us with promises like Pinocchio going to Pleasure Island. Do you remember that? And he turns into a donkey, finds out it's all a lie. That's what the devil does. Always we want to look at the enemy, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this even tonight because we need to understand how he works. But we always want to give place to the gospel and grace and not focus on the enemy and sin as much we want to be ruthless with sin we want to be ruthless with looking at the enemy but we want to be more ruthless with who God is and grace because all through scripture the enemy, he's everywhere but he's always overshadowed by the grace and the power of God so we must be careful and recognize that he is a foe that has already been defeated we must must remember that in our heart of hearts so this is why we look at scripture like this now What is God doing? Why is God doing this? There's a couple of things that don't seem consistent in what we've done over the last few weeks. In 1 Kings 11, after Solomon sinned, we read that God raised up an adversary. Actually, three, didn't we? We talked about that. That God restrains and harnesses. He just dragged out enemies that he had defeated. David had defeated long ago. God let him go. Because why? He was doing something. Well, now in Hezekiah... There's an enemy that we know God is directed because we saw that in Isaiah 10. The, the, he's the, the uh, king of Assyria is just the club of the wrath of God. God says, he's in my hand. I'm doing what I need him to do. He wants to destroy all of you. That's his goal. That's not mine. And I'm, by the way, when he's done with what I'm doing with him, I'm going to destroy him for his evil. So God's got it. God's orchestrating all of this. So we've got one king that's faithful, Hezekiah, and he gets an enemy. We've got another king that's not faithful, and he gets an enemy. What is God doing? Well, maybe at some point we'll talk about, I'm not quite sure, I don't want to get into too much detail now, but you have to understand the state of the nation of Israel at this point. So there is a lot of back stuff that God's got to deal with. There's been this reform and there's been this return. I want you to turn to Isaiah 46. What is God up to with the enemy? What was he doing in the Old Testament? And of course, we don't just read words on a page. We pull them off and say, God, what are you teaching me about your ways, your kingdom work? Isaiah 46, verse 8. What is God up to? Remember this. Fix it in mind. Take it to heart, you rebels, Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God, there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning. From ancient times, what is still to come. I say, my purpose, we're looking for his purpose, right? My purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. From the east, I summon a bird of prey. That's what? The predator, it's an enemy. From a far off land, a man to fulfill what? My purpose. What I have said, that will I bring about. What I have planned, that will I do. Listen to me, you stubborn hearted. You who are far from righteousness, I am bringing my what? Righteousness, righteousness near. near. What is God's goal? That we be righteous, that we be holy. You shall be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Oh, that's what I started to say earlier. I, I lost it. Even though God had called out the line, the whole Levite line, and then specifically the, 
the line of Aaron within the Levites to do all the priestly stuff. He called those out, set them apart from his people. And yet in the middle of that, he says, but you're all a king of priests, a holy nation. What was to set them apart? It's their holiness. God's purpose is righteousness and holiness. So even though Hezekiah was doing the right things and the people were responding, is that going to be the salvation of Israel? No, because those three circles I draw are just going to keep playing out. It's going to happen again with Josiah. It just keeps happening. It just keeps happening. Um, Judah has to fall. <laughs> we say, well, why? Because there's two kingdoms, and only one is going to survive. Judah has to fall, even with good King Hezekiah, even with good King Josiah that's to come, even with great King David, even without the sin of Solomon, even without the sin of Adam and Eve. What has to happen? We have to fall. Sin has to come. We say, well, Eve didn't have to sin. Well, Romans teaches us that the commandment doomed her because as soon as God uttered the commandment, she wasn't going to be able to keep it. See, we have to really get to know our hearts and know what we're capable of. Not just the people we see that we cluck our tongues at. How, I don't know how they can fall to that. But when you really see your heart, you can't do what God requires. You absolutely can't. So the whole goal of this is in Romans 5. So turn to Romans 5. I love this section because in just five or six verses... We're going to see God's whole plan summed up. He is bringing righteousness to pass. Look at verse 12 of Romans 5. Therefore, I'll wait till everybody gets there. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all sinned. Do you see what happened? That's Genesis 3. Through Adam and Eve, or Adam, the one man, sin entered the world, and we were all doomed after that. Now jump to verse 17. And, and this, as Paul is making this argument, it starts sounding a little convoluted, and I'm, I'm just for clarity going to focus on it in a few verses, but go back and study it. You'll see I'm not, I'm not giving you anything that's not there. I'm not leaving anything out. I just for clarity want to jump to the verses I think that sum it up. And that's in verse uh, 17. For if, by the trespass of the one man, Adam, for if by the trespass of that one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through who? The one man, Jesus Christ. That's why they have to emphasize the man, Jesus, what he went through for us as a man. That's why he could be that perfect Passover lamb. Consequently, verse 18, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, Adam, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, many will be made what? Righteous. Righteous. You know, in Hebrews it says Jesus learned obedience. That's what they mean. It wasn't that he wasn't perfect, but it meant he suffered in his obedience. And through that, many were made righteous. This was the purpose of God from the beginning of time. Verse 20 <laughs> takes in the books of law and then the whole history of the nation of Israel. The books of law that set it in motion, <coughs> why it came, and then how it worked. Verse 20, the law was added so the trespass might increase. Actually, I really could say that starts in Genesis 3. As soon as God gave the law, as soon as he spoke, more formally, when he actually administered it in Exodus, all those chapters in Exodus and Leviticus, what was that all for? We wouldn't be able to keep it. We were going to sin more. The law was added so this trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. This is what you see happening in the Old Testament. The people keep sinning. Yes, God has to judge sin, but what's he doing? He's restoring them. He's rescuing them all the time. He never, ever leaves them because it's who he is so that 
So the law was added, that's the books of law, but sin kept increasing in the Old Testament, so grace increased all the more, so that when the fullness of time could come, in Galatians 4, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also what? Grace, grace might reign through what? Grace. Righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What is the goal? That grace would reign. If there wasn't sin, there couldn't be grace. Grace is the expression of who God is, his mercy, his abundant loving kindness to us. So that righteousness that's bestowed upon us in Jesus, that was the goal. And yet, like Hezekiah, we continue to pursue holiness. We're saved, we're his, but we continue to pursue holiness because Romans 6 goes on and talks about that. So look at verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? He's asking a perfect question, really. It's rhetorical. But now that we've got grace and we're protected, well, then we're not under the law, so we can sin and it'll be okay. By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey, notice the obedience, as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey if you keep my covenants and obey my commands that's what god is saying jesus learned obedience whether you're slaves to sin which leads to death or obedience which leads to righteousness, righteousness. thanks be to god that you used to be slaves of sin you what yes there's a word there though you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted You've been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Mm -hmm. And then he says, I'm putting this in human terms because you're weak in your natural selves. In other words, I'm giving this whole analogy of a slave. Are we slaves? You know, we're the children of God. We're adopted as his sons and heirs. Mm -hmm. But he's using that analogy so that we understand. Just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, <laughs> So now offer them in slavery to righteousness leading to holiness. holiness. So you understand that the obedience in verse 16, obedience leads to righteousness. The righteousness in Christ turning to him, obeying him, leads us to righteousness that he declares in verse 19. And then righteousness leads to holy, actual holiness. I am making you holy. Be holy for I am holy. Consecrate yourselves, make yourselves holy. That's that whole reciprocal, participatory relationship that we have with God. And what is the goal? Holiness. holiness. I know that there's a lot of different ways we could describe what holiness is, and we're going to be, because we're going to spend some time in this priestly role. This is what is so hard for us, but it's what God is doing. It's what helps us understand the attacks of the enemy. It's what helps us to know when we're going through a hard time what it's for what God is doing with it. He's always increasing our holiness, our knowledge of his ways. I was mentioning to the ladies this morning that, um, and, and I don't mean this ever to, to keep anybody from ever wanting to share a prayer request, but we tend to offer a lot of prayer requests for people with physical needs, especially if it's a scary diagnosis. Because we get scared, it's a big, very big thing. If somebody's seriously ill, we realize how really fragile we are. And yet, and I said this last week, aren't we all going to die? Isn't there really only one question? Do you know Jesus? Do you know where you're going? Our spiritual condition needs to concern us much more. So when you know somebody's sick, and someone made a prayer request this morning, a pretty dire prayer request, and at the end of she was, he needs Christ. <laughs> His life was pretty much over from the diagnosis, and certainly we pray for healing, but what does he really need? He needs Christ, because if God heals him, Either God's going to take him home because he's going to return or he's going to die again, mm -hmm. this, death, this death. See, this is what we have to remember. Turn to 2 Timothy 1. <coughs> Verse 8. Paul's last letter, the last words we have of his, and he says this. So do not, do not be ashamed to testify of our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel. I want you to hear this. 
suffering, but suffering by the power of God, listen to that, who has saved us and called us to a, what? Holy, holy life. life yeah. Not because of anything we've done, but because of his own purpose. Remember, his purpose was what? To bring righteousness, which was what? So the grace would reign. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Do you see how it was God's plan before time began for grace to be in effect, to come before sin, to make us holy, to make us righteous in his eyes, and then let, tell us, live a holy life. Guys, it's so simple. What messes us up is our heart that we can't control. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Right there, he gives a whole message about the devil. He's already been destroyed, and yet <laughs> he's afoot. Mm -hmm. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. This is why I'm suffering as I am. What? He's a preacher. He's full of the power of God. He's doing all the right things. Hezekiah did everything. And yet still what? Did he suffer? Yeah. <laughs> a terrible attack of the enemy. We can't just breezily blow that off from Chronicles and do, oh yeah, it'll be fine, stand strong. There, there's more to the story than that. This is why I'm suffering as I am. Yet I'm not ashamed because I know whom I've believed. I'm convinced that he's able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. A holy nation. Remember I told you about that violence, that force, that passionate pursuit of holiness that arouses the enemy. Do you see where the suffering comes in? We're suffering, but we're suffering by the power of God. Do you understand that? Suffering because of the gospel. Why are we suffering because of the gospel? Because there's still two kingdoms. Hezekiah saw that. The people saw that. The insult was really against God. So what Hezekiah had to do, how did he fight? By pursuing holiness with great passion. And he stood. Romans 6, you wholeheartedly obeyed. Do you see? Wholeheartedly, all of your energy, all of your zeal. So our battle plan, and this I want to just talk about the, the enemy for just a little bit. Our battle plan is as Hezekiah, withstand him, pursue holiness, and that's an act of aggression. So what's the enemy going to do? Come back. Of course he is. Until God calls him off. Did God not call him off with Hezekiah? Of course. Of course he will use him as a tool to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. We see that pain and the overwhelm in the king's account, but we see that confidence of victory in Chronicles. And you can hear it in Hezekiah. It was expected and assumed and no, we're going to make it. We're going to get through this. Why? Because faith was rising up. Even under the load that we see in Kings where he's so weary and say, oh God, if you don't do this, we're sunk. But his faith was still rising up. That's how we do battle. Number two, and we do it all the way to the cross. What is the cross? It's the place of suffering. It's the greatest, the greatest suffering, but the greatest victory and the greatest glory. This is hard for us to understand, but this is what's happening with Paul. In his very last letter, what's going to happen? He's going to be beheaded very soon. And his last breath, all the way to his death, <laughs> the enemy's going to be breathing down his neck and will think he's won when Paul's head is lopped off. But has he? No. That was Paul's greatest glory. Where was he going? To eternity. There's the same thing with Jesus. Jesus went willingly <laughs> to the cross. He went willingly to the cross with great humility that looked to us like utter passivity. He didn't even raise his voice. That doesn't sound very like aggressive warfare. What was it? It was aggressive warfare because he was being obedient to his father's plan. And what happened in that moment of that ultimate suffering that was also his what ultimate victory you can't separate the two the suffering is just like the cross the suffering is where it's conquered it's where god shuts the enemy down because didn't he do that on the cross he was fully shut down under god's control he had been conquered i know he's still we're gonna have to talk about that 
a little bit more. But the enemy was defeated on the cross. So, defeating the enemy and developing holiness in us is a hand in glove, inseparable relationship. God uses what the enemy is doing. To, as we defeat him, as he's making us holy, we are defeating the enemy. It, it's just how it works. And yes, he presses in harder. But this is that pattern also that we say maintained in scripture. Where does God bring the victory? Where we are pressing through, where he's making, where we're being obedient, where we're in covenant with him and doing what he says and standing in faith and cleaning up our lives. What happens? We defeat the enemy. Mm -hmm. It happens all at the same time, not necessarily in our time frame at the same time, but in God's time, it's all the same. He's always restoring. He's always renewing at the same time that the judgment is going on. As soon as there's repentance, as soon as we're turning, the restoration is already in progress. It's because grace is to reign. Ultimately, it's God himself orchestrating what the enemy does. He is harnessing and restraining for his purpose, which is our holiness. He was working out his holiness in Israel and Hezekiah led the pack and he got to be caught up in it even though basically at that point he was innocent. So just right quick, I'll just kind of cut to the chase. How do we press through the lies? Whatever lies you're hearing in your life, not every battle looks as dramatic as what we just read. If it was, we might see it illustrated more clearly, but that's what the understanding is. It was the lies of the enemy. So I don't know what lies you hear. Is it self-condemnation? Oh, I messed up again. i got to try harder. Well, that's, that's awful. <laughs> That'll just keep you on a, that gerbil's wheel. Is it shame? Is it falling to fear? All those are roots of unbelief. Or is it the other side where you want to deny your sin or minimize it or blame somebody else or justify it's so easy to say, he makes me so mad. I know <laughs> who's responsible for your heart. You, right? That's the battle. That's what all this boils down to and looks like in your life. Identifying what the enemy is telling you, and God will be firm with you. He gives you all the grace when you turn to him. I, Beth, I've got you. But he also will be hard on you and let you know, hey, that's your deal. You can't blame them for that. That's you. He will keep you, keep you, keep you, convicting you until that place where you really and truly are surrendered to the degree that you can be until the next time. But the pattern keeps repeating. And I think I've probably said gracious plenty enough. New Hope at Home, we'll see you next week. And we're going to just continue uh, our journey through this. What does holiness look like? Why is it so important that we are priests? Why is it that we don't understand this? You can tell already. It's like you go, really? That's what he wants of us? That's what Jesus said. I confer on you a kingdom. And it's to make you like me. God says, be holy for I am holy. He made you holy. And then he's making you holier all the time. We'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us.